Hey everyone, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, June 17th, 2016. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, and we've got an all-star lineup, of course, our regulars, and we've got what could has to be the best timing the Weekly Space Hangout has ever had, literally in the history of the show. So I'm really excited to get to our special guests as well. Uh, we're going to be talking about this week... Um, oh no... We're going to be talking about uh, the discovery of a habitable zone around a Tatooine planet, experimenting with lighting fires in space. That's a terrible idea. Um, uh, an excess of hot Jupiters. Uh, the fact that most of the world can't see the Milky Way. Uh, we're going to see a bunch of new space telescopes renewed by NASA and Earth's quasi-moon. And so, joining our regular rogues here, we've got uh, Paul Matt Sutter. That's me. Oh, there he is. How's it going, Paul? Pretty awesome. How are you, Fraser? Good, and thanks for collaborating with me this week uh, well, on, thank uh, you on the YouTube. Well, collaborating with me. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, if you haven't, if you have no idea what we're talking about, Paul and I did an episode on uh, virtual particles this week, so you should definitely check out the YouTube channel. In reality, we talked about it before. It was, it was a lot of wibble wobble, wibble wobble, bloop bloop. I've lost count of how many times I used that phrase. Yeah. yeah I think it's it useful. Yeah. Uh, we got Morgan Renberg. Hey, Morgan. Hey, Fraser. Good to be here. Welcome, welcome. Uh, we did not collaborate on a video this week, but we uh, th that doesn't mean that we way. haven't collaborated in the past and shouldn't collaborate in the future. So, Indeed. so we'll get on that. Uh, we got Kimberly Cartier. Kimberly. Hi, Fraser. Now, Glad to you, be back after a couple weeks. Now, do you want to give one last minute plug for a certain uh kickstarter is there time well the kickstarter is officially closed but i just learned that they did meet their uh fundraising goal to observe tabby star using crowdsourced funding so that's pretty uh, pretty awesome so what does I that just, mean now so does that mean that there's going to be dedicated means, telescope time that means that astronomers have enough money to purchase time on this telescope network to do continuous observations of Tabby Star, which is the alien megastructure star, to try and uh, be watching it right when the next event occurs. So this is incredibly exciting. And I can't think of another instance where astronomers have crowdfunded astronomy efforts like this. So it's exciting. That is absolutely fantastic. There's Congratulations. A page. It says success. Yay. Yay. Very excited. Cool. All right. And our special guest, and this is where the incredible timing comes in. We've got Kai Stats and Mike Landry uh, to talk about LIGO. And, of course, if you haven't heard, uh, LIGO made its second detection uh, or announced its second detection just in the last couple of days. So I, I can't wait. We're going to talk about it. So, hey, Kai and, and Mike, how's it going? Hi. Good. Thank you for having us. Uh, yeah, hey, for Good to be here. This is going to be some switching, Chad. All right. Uh, um, cool. So, uh, Kai, why don't you give us a quick intro on, on who you are and, and what you do, and then we'll get into the actual discovery with Mike. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um, for the last four years, I've worked as a documentary filmmaker, which has taken me on a, uh, on a worldwide tour. And I had the great fortune three years ago of being introduced to Gabriella, the spokesperson for LIGO, through a former client of mine, a good friend, a, a black hole astrophysicist at the UMass Dartmouth. And uh, so I was six months later, um, our proposal was accepted and funded, and I showed up at LIGO, uh, Hanford in Washington. And Mike, who's with us today, was a gracious host and spent nearly two weeks uh, with me, or I should say I spent two weeks with him at his site and uh, was able to film and uh, produce the first the first film I've done for LIGO, which is called LIGO, A Passion for Understanding. And uh, it was a great success. We, uh, we launched it in uh, April of 2014. And six weeks later, the second film was funded by the National Science Foundation through the University of Mississippi. And, uh, and that was LIGO Generations, which was launched in January of 2015. And, uh, and now I'm working on the third film, which is LIGO Detection. And I've been working on that since October of last year. In fact, I'm here at Caltech, um, just finished filming here uh, two days ago and doing interviews about the, uh, the, the validation process of detecting uh, these merging black holes. So it's been a wonderful journey. I've been, I feel very fortunate and very lucky to have worked with such amazing people for the last three years and to now be working on the third and what will be, I hope, the best film. Fantastic. And Mike, you are the uh, detection lead scientist at LIGO. 
That's right. I'm, uh, I'm a detection lead scientist at LIGO Hanford Observatories, which is one of the two uh, observatory sites we have in the U.S. There's LIGO Hanford in Washington State, and there's LIGO Louisiana uh, in uh, Livingston Parish, Louisiana. And so there's two of us uh, detection scientists who are focused on uh, driving towards the first detection. And uh, we made, uh, we basically made advanced LIGO, uh, the detectors, installing them from two th uh, 2010 to 2015. And uh, then we ran our first observation run from sep mid-September 2015 to January, mid-January this year. And we've announced uh, two different binary black hole coalescences that were observed. The first one, this massive event on September 14th that we announced on February 11th, uh, two you know, roughly 30 solar mass black holes in spiraling and merging and, and, and emitting three solar masses of energy, all in gravitational waves, none in light. And then on December 26th, we had a second, you know, a gold-plated five sigma event of two black holes in spiraling together, different black holes, lighter black holes, uh, 14 solar masses and eight solar masses emitting about one solar mass in gravitational wave energy. So we just announced that on Wednesday. Right. And that, and right. And that's the second detection. So, uh, you know, how often were you expecting this scale of event to be detected? And how does that compare now that you are actually turning up these these events? Well, so, you know, we had a, we got a surprise that it was binary black holes in the data with with a, we had run about a month uh, in uh, sort of commissioning and um, engineering mode and uh, calibration mode prior to uh, the event September 14th. And uh, then we really stabilized the instruments, and it was only on the third day of really stable running that we got this loud event, and it turned out to be binary black holes. And that was a surprise. Uh, we were expecting that a first detection, if it even came in this first observation run, would be uh, a binary neutron star system. So two, you know, roughly 1.4 solar mass neutron stars, corpses of dead stars, in spiraling and merging together to form a black hole. Instead, you had this fairly exotic event unexpected uh, 36 and 29 solar mass uh, black holes coalescing. The rates for these, the rates were predicted all the way from zero up to, you know, something on the order of a thousand events per, well, per cubic gigaparsec, so a large volume uh, per year. And uh, so we were, were able now to bound that rate, zeros off the table. People who thought there will be no mergers in the lifetime of the universe, that's out the window. And the rate that we've set with the two events, plus a third weaker event, which we can't say categorically is a, a binary black hole, uh, we call it a trigger. Uh, those two sort of two and a half events give us a rate of nine to 250 per cubic gigaparsec per year. Uh, I'll be interested to hear about that that third event, but uh, um, you know, is that another another scoop, another announcement here on the weekly space hangout, but. Um, uh, right. Okay. So, and so, so that sort of, um, cause I know like before that first event detection, it was a, it was a really big question whether the facility was going to turn up any of these at all. And now we're in this place where it's really, uh, I guess, proven the success of ground-based gravitational wave observation. Where do you think we go from here? Yeah. So I, the, the interferometers are only at a third of their sensitivity from advanced LIGO. And interferometers, a little different than a telescope in that you don't just turn it on and run at its sort of design sensitivity. It really takes years of beating down the noise, identifying what the worst noise terms are, making the instrument better through progressively applying better software loops and maybe some hardware tweaks. And so we're, we're at about a third of the way through our design sensitivity for this first observation run. And we got this sort of two, maybe two and a half events. Uh, where do we go just for binary black holes alone if we make our design sensitivity in, say, our third observing run, something like 2018 or so? It's conceivable we'll get a binary black hole merger every day or every couple of days. That's just stunning, phenomenally stunning. If you asked, you know, I asked Ray Weiss, one of the principals of the experiment, uh, what he most wanted to see, and this is several years ago, and he said, binary black holes 
I mean, he wasn't, it, it, it's objects of pure space-time coalescing. It's one of the cleanest experiments you can do with LIGO. Um, oh, just phenomenal. So Kai, I'd love to know sort of from your perspective as I guess both a scientist, but also as a person who's really kind of getting the word out there, how has it been for you to actually sort of take their story, the story of this search for gravitational waves and, and get that out into the hands of the public? Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll clarify. I'm a scientist, scientist in training. I can't claim that title just yet, but maybe by the end of the year I can. Um, it's been, I guess, as a storyteller who works through the medium of film, every time that I, I can interview an individual person who we don't, as a society, uphold and say this person is great, and I can find compelling stories. Or I can interview people who we do uphold as great and find equally compelling stories. But when you find a thousand people in organization, um, some of which have been working towards this event for 30 years, there's a greater depth to the storytelling. There's a kind of dedication, a kind of um, enthusiasm and passion, as, as we titled the first film, a passion for understanding that goes beyond, I think, what most of us perceive in our daily life. And I think that's incredibly inspiring and something we can all uphold and look forward to is to say, we live in a, most of us live in a fairly day-to-day -day grind of, of, of what we do in the morning and noon and night, morning and noon and night, but we don't really think 20, 30, 40 years down the line. And there's now been four, moving on five generations of researchers dedicated toward proving the last piece of Einstein's theory of general, general theory of relativity and also um, discovering these incredible objects that Mike described. And that's just now coming to fruition right now in our lifetime. And I think it's just, it's awesome. And to be a part of that in a small way, to be um, someone who's been involved in these last three years as, as a storyteller, it's just been an outstanding opportunity. Uh, it's a, I mean, it's a pretty tough thing to communicate, right? That, that the, the amount that we are getting, uh, distorted, warped, the, the space time around us is getting changed. You know, it's a, you know, it's not something that we can feel. You had to build this incredibly delicate instrument to do it. The events that happen, we have no pictures. We can only sort of run our imagination. So did you find trying to communicate this is sort of a, a pretty unique challenge? It's a good question. Um, I do act as a translator, and that's something I really enjoy. So I work with people like Mike. In fact, Mike and I were at his home. He has a blackboard in his, in his, uh, in his dining room, and we spent an entire evening kind of storyboarding how we were going to tell a certain segment of it. And then the next day we wrote a script, and the next day we filmed in the auditorium, which became, I think you guys have a screenshot of it, of uh, one of the researchers, Jameson, holding a, a star in his hands, and that was something that we had storyboarded. So it is difficult. It's difficult to take these complex um, phenomenon that are best described by mathematics. Mathematics is the best medium to describe these most accurately, and, and yet that's a medium by which, or a language by which the, most of the public simply can't follow. So my job is to take those complex subjects and relay them through my, my art, uh, my VFX um, director, my special effects animator, um, who's a fantastic individual, Leo, and then run it by Marco Cavaglia, who acts as the, so, the, uh, the associate producer. There we go, there's the image. And through Mike and through Gabby. And we, it's kind of a, a, a round robin system where I take a first stab at it, we do a draft, we run it past the scientists, make certain we've got it right, we didn't, we adjust it. Sometimes it's four, five, six, eight, ten iterations to make certain that what we're portraying on screen is as accurate as possible in an animation or a simulation. It's an arduous process, but in the end, it really works and it's fun um, because the scientists say, well, you did it. We, you, know, you presented this in such a way that the public gets it and it's pretty darn close to what we would have done if we were doing a mathematical model. And that's the goal is to find that balance between the two. Yeah. Um, so Mike, I mean, one of the things that really fascinates me about about this is that with gravitational waves, it's starting to give us access to, you know, regions that were unexplorable before, like like within the event horizon of a black hole and and things like that. So so how do you think that as we get better and better techniques and technology to really see these these gravitational waves, you know, what kinds of you know where are we gonna be able to push the boundaries of what we can start to understand? Right. So, I mean, these detectors are accessing a regime of the uh, uh, of nature that we haven't before. So, the only way to see these merging black holes is through their gravitational waves. Even though so much energy comes off the system, 
it's not coming out in electromagnetic means in light or gamma rays or infrared or anything like that. It's all coming out in deformations in the shape of space in these ripples in space time that are gravitational waves. And so they're going to tell you about things that you can't see otherwise. Uh, some examples would be, say if we do in the next run or the run after that, observe neutron stars merging together and forming a black hole. If we get enough signal to noise out of this uh, system, we'll start to understand about the, the equation of state, the description of nuclear matter at its, uh, in its densest way. And this, you know, we can think of a neutron star as basically a massive nucleus, something of, that weighs a billion tons per teaspoon. And, and that's a way to probe this equation of state, which is unknown in, in nuclear physics. It's going to tell you things that you can't access otherwise. Or uh, another example would be if, you, if a star goes supernova, you know, that light is all uh, perturbed and scattered on the way out. Neutrinos provide a partial glimpse into the cores of supernova as they collapse. And we saw that with the 1987A supernova, where a handful of, of neutrinos were detected. A, a gravitational wave detector, if it's sufficiently sensitive, will, will allow you to peer into the cores of supernova as they uh, form a neutron star or potentially a black hole. So there's really, there's, there's physics there that's inaccessible by other uh, detectors. Maybe the best example is how do you peer back to the Big Bang? How do you see the first instance after the Big Bang? And right now we're held off at this 300,000 years point, which is the, the surface of last scattering known as the cosmic microwave background. But you can't see prior to that with electromagnetic means. There's an analog of the cosmic microwave background in gravitational waves, the so-called stochastic gravitational wave background. We'll probably not see that with ground-based interferometers, but other detectors, things like the space-based LISA detector in the future, or potentially pulsar timing arrays on the Earth, or uh, the BICEP experiments and similar experiments that look for the polarization of the cosmic microwave background and the imprint, imprint of gravitational waves. Seeing these primordial gravitational waves will tell us about epochs of physics that we don't understand between the time of the Big Bang and 300,000 years after. Yeah, yeah, absolutely just amazing. Um, you know, right now with, with LIGO, I know there's two detectors, right? There's the separated far apart, and it doesn't give a lot of directionality to, to what you're doing. So I would love to hear what some of the sort of future plans are to be able to, to start to get a better sense on, on where these events have happened, and then also sort of what future sensitivity can happen. Right, so, uh, you know, gravitational waves are, uh, they're, Gravitational waves are not sound, uh, but they give an observable that's akin to sound. So the, the detector on Earth is a transducer for gravitational wave strain to some electrical readout. So it kind of functions like your ear in a sense. Your ear, see, you know, it's sensitive to these compression waves and, and is a transducer to a signal that goes to your brain. And so if a gravitational wave passes through the Earth at the speed of light, which is the expected speed of travel, those waves will modulate the arms of a given ground-based detector first and then another and then another and based on that time of arrival you can triangulate where in the sky that source comes from but we do a pretty crappy job of that compared to em astronomers who can put really small error boxes on where something came from we you know our if you look at the error boxes on these first couple of papers they're about 900 square degrees that's a really tough follow-up to do multi-messenger astronomy for you know, radio telescopes and space-based telescopes like Fermi and Swift and ground-based uh, light and uh, infrared telescopes. Uh, so we need more detectors to make a better air box, a smaller air box in the sky. Virgo, the three kilometer uh, detector in uh, Kashina near Pisa, that will come online late this year or early next year and join in observing runs with LIGO. And that triangulation will, will immediately uh, reduce the uncertainty in the, uh, the air box in the sky for a, for a given source. And uh, after that, Kagra in a few years uh, will come online, the Japanese detector, which is in the same mine that houses the Super Kamiokande neutrino detector. That detector is, is nearing installation completion. And then after that, you'll have LIGO India, which is approved, but not yet uh, 
being built, but will be built in sort of the 20, 2022, 2023 timeframe, they'll come online. And all of that will allow us to shrink the error box in the sky, hand off better coordinates for follow-up for binary neutron stars, binary black holes in case, you know, you want to check. There might be a torus around some black holes. There may be some EM radiation. For any source that we get, we can ask electromagnetic astronomers to follow up, and that will really usher in this age of multi-messenger astronomy in which we partner and, and reap much better science by virtue of all of these telescopes looking at the object in different ways. Uh, so I got a couple of questions here from the audience. Uh, this one comes from R. Joan. Uh, when LIGO is at full power, will we be able to study black hole pairs for longer than just the point of collision? Mm -hmm. Well, already we're doing that. So this second event, well, remember the first event, if you've looked at it, it was only in the detector for 0.2 seconds. That's about 10 oscillations or about five uh, revolutions of the binary black hole orbit. It's a massive system, so it shifts in lower and lower frequencies. This second black hole event, uh, that was in the detector for a full second and uh, sort of 55 oscillations of the wave train and uh, about 27 orbits of the, of the black holes. Uh, so, and that's because it's a lighter system and that ship shifts the chirp frequency, the, the merger frequency up to higher and higher bands. And so if we go to higher power, like the question, the good question, if does higher power help? It actually doesn't help you much for binary black holes because higher powers reduce a technical noise, a quantum noise in the interferometer known as shot noise, that pushes down the high frequency noise in the interferometer. So that allows you to access uh, binary neutron stars because they're, um, uh, they're, they're still less massive, higher frequency points. That'll allow you to, say, tease out this nuclear equation of state. But you want to do to get more cycles in for a given binary black hole is to push down the low frequency end and that means better control loops, better diagonalization of our systems, um, a, a reduction of something called, uh, well, ultimately uh, some form of seismic noise. It's called gravity gradient noise, where the test masses move around because a compression wave goes by. Not because they're jangled by seismicity, but because sort of like a pith ball that leans, a pith ball on a string that leans towards a mountain because there's a Newtonian gravitational term pulling on the fifth ball, the test masses actually get pulled around just by density fluctuations in the ground. Really great. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, Paul, I know you've got a question. Muted Paul Matt Sutter has a question. Unmuted now has a question. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned uh, searching for primordial gravitational waves. And a few years ago, there was this bicep announcement that they had seen signatures of primordial gravitational waves in the cosmic microwave background. And my question for you is, which is easier observationally to look for imprints of those gravitational waves in the microwave background, in the surface of last scattering, or to directly look for the gravitational waves themselves. There's kind of challenges with both approaches. Uh, which do you think would be the better route? Well, that's a tough question. I mean, they're both extremely difficult experiments. The bicep experiment that had what they thought was evidence for uh, primordial gravitational waves in the cosmic microwave, microwave background had already made, made just a magnificent experiment that lowered the, you know, the that, that increase the sensitivity or lower the noise in their detector by a factor of 10, which is just outlandishly good. So this beautiful experiment, in the end, what they saw was obscured by foreground dust in our galaxy. They're going to continue pushing on that instrument, making BICEP-3. I think, they'll, I think they're much better poised to find that before any ground-based detector. Our, if our ground-based detectors run together for a year and we correlate our data, we'll at best be you know, if, if the early universe is not dominated by some exotic uh, symmetry breaking mechanism, some exotic cosmology, and only inflation rules, which is what everything points to right now, then we'll be something like two to three orders of magnitude too insensitive to see this. So uh, BICEP, uh, the pulsar timing array, at least in the future, these experiments are better poised. 
And BICEP3 is, uh, BICEP3 is installed in Antarctica. And if I understand correctly, if I remember it, doesn't it come online this year, BICEP3? I think it does. I'm not sure of the start date. Thanks, Kai. Uh, Kai, you know, the ground-based uh, observations are one part of the puzzle, but there's this sort of this now, this whole drive towards a space-based gravitational wave detection. So have you been incorporating some of that into the work that you're doing? Not, not yet. The third film, the, the work, the film I'm working on now is is really about um, September 14th to fe February 11th. It's about the validation of the of the first detection. Um, but we may be moving that film into, and hopefully the, the closing segment of that film does talk about the future of gravitational wave astronomy. In which case, it would include uh, the LISA project. I'm not an expert in LISA. Um, I do understand that it's it would be in its optimal form, be a triad. It would be three satellites that are following the Earth around its orbit in the sun in order to have an incredibly long interferometer baseline, which is able to detect a very different frequency range, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, than what LIGO is able to address. Um, and in my, if I understand correctly, the current implementation or the test run is gonna be two bodies, not three, is that correct? Uh, well, so uh, the current plan, which is ELISA, is still three satellites, but uh, they're not equal um, partners in that, so there are sort of two uh, minor satellites and one major one. So it's still three three detectors, but that that could change. Uh, uh, Lisa has just gone through this Pathfinder phase, which launched in December and put out a, a physical review letters article that everyone should go have a quick look at on online at PRL, and it's an utterly uh, beautiful experiment that's worked, you know, an order of magnitude or two better than expected or advertised, really paving the way for uh, Lisa to be built. It was sort of the last test that needed to be uh, done in order to allow uh, the experiment to go forward. Uh, so I got another question here. This comes from Ocean McIntyre. Is there any cross observation between the neutrino observation facilities and the various gravitational wave facilities to see if there's any correlation? So have there been a stream of neutrinos showing up at the same time as gravitational waves? So uh, neutrino experiments such as Antares and Ice Cube are, are uh, partners with uh, LIGO on uh, these follow-up studies that are done. We, we basically asked astronomers around the world, are you interested in following up if we have triggers in our first observation runs and going forward after that? And uh, many groups responded, about 63 groups responded and made uh, MOUs with LIGO and, and Virgo in order to to do this follow-up. So there was neutrino follow-up and you can go, if you go to papers.ligo.org, you'll see all the companion papers that were published associated with the first event. And uh, there you can read up on the neutrino follow-up. There's not been any um, you know, positive uh, neutrino detections or correlations between neutrinos and gravitational waves, but it's absolutely just like electromagnetic astronomy, one of the follow-ups we'd like to do and ultimately learn more about in the process. Fantastic. Well, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, Kai, can you give people some more information on where they can find the, the, the projects you've worked on so far and, and follow when the next one comes out? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you. Um, LIGO.org, L-I-G-O dot O-R-G, has uh, both of the films that i produced so far, Passion and Generations, um, on the right-hand column. And if you go to Facebook.com slash LIGO film, um, it's a, I, I try to keep it updated on a regular basis as I visit different institutions and conduct uh, interviews. I post uh, stills and updates um, as those films are produced. Yep, there we are right there. There's the two films. Fantastic. So just go to LIGO.org and you can get uh, more information and watch the films. And they're just freely available on the LIGO site, right? Absolutely, yes. In fact, we encourage these to be shown in high schools and university settings. They've been used all around the world as, as an educational tool, but also as an inspirational tool. And each film is progressively a little bit more technical, a little more information. The third one will have some outstanding animations that we just finished and, uh, and really dive into more of the technical aspects, but still not, still be engaging, still be exciting to watch. Fantastic. Well, uh, Kai and Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really glad we got a chance to talk to you so quickly after the discovery. And, uh, and hopefully we can have you back on again, perhaps after we've you know, detected those primordial gravitational waves or, or seen inside the event horizon of, a, of, a, of two colliding black holes, you know, the, that kind of thing. So that'd be great. 
Good. Thank you very much. Thanks for the time. All right. Yeah, Thanks a lot. That's great. Take care. All right. Uh, let's move on uh, to some of the other shows. I choose which one now. Now the windows have to reconfigure themselves. So <clears throat> and chat has to build. So so build a window, and I will uh, go to that guest. <laughs> I, it's all breaking. Okay, well, you know what? Let it break. I'm going to say hi to all those people that I didn't get a chance to say hello to now. So I'm going to say hi to Alex Despland, Billy Gordon, Damian Reloaded, Gudu Bibra, John Suffolk, Kappa W, Larry Beckham, Nancy Graziano, Ocean McIntyre, Passendiros, PJ Gallegos, Arjun, Simon Love, Warbash, Yon Sofri, and Zach Cody. Uh, those are the people who are active in the last five minutes. Um, normally more people say hello, but we didn't get a chance to, to get them to them yet. Um, cool. And I also want to let you know that we're going to be going into our, our summer hiatus. So I believe we've got two more shows after today's episode, one more show after today's episode. Uh, and then we are going to be taking the summer off. And that's, of course, we're going to spend some time learning how to use this software. Uh, we're also going to be going out and actually shooting more videos outside. So we're still going to work, but uh, everyone, especially the the panelists, get to go in and have themselves a bit of a vacation. So because uh, it's hard showing up every single week and doing these shows and the river is very warm and I want to go swimming. So so, uh, so again, thanks to all of your support over the over the year, and uh, we will be getting uh, back up and again and running shortly after DragonCon in September. So, uh, also want to remind you that we're going to be going into Astronomy Cast literally half an hour after we wrap up the weekly Space Hangout. So, if you want more space news and shows and information, then just uh, follow us over to Astronomy Cast. All right, could you tell that I was stalling for time while Chad rearranged all of the windows. Uh, I choose Kimberly. That's me. Let's talk about something. Uh, I choose uh, a Tatooine planet habitable zone. All right. This is one of uh, this is one of the most exciting planets that I've personally seen. I'm very, very happy about it. This planet is called, first off, Kepler 1647b. And by Tatooine planet, what we mean is that it's a planet orbiting two stars at the same time. So this is a circumbinary planet. And not only is it the largest circumbinary planet that we have ever discovered, it is also in the habitable zone of this circumbinary system, which is incredibly hard to manage. So this, this system has two sun-like stars, so both of which are about the same size and temperature as the sun. And these two stars orbit each other as well, in an eclipsing binary system of only about 11 day orbit. And then outside of that, you have this Jupiter sized Jupiter masked planet uh, orbiting in a period of three years. And it's actually orbiting in the habitable zone of this circumbinary system. Uh, and, cir and circumbinary habitable zones are incredibly complicated things because uh, with a single star, the habitable zones are essentially stationary at any particular time. The star is particular temperature and your planet's a particular distance away from that uh, source of heat. And so it's either in the habitable zone or it isn't. But when you have two stars that are themselves orbiting each other, the habitable zone itself is constantly shifting and changing. And if you want a planet to actually be in the habitable zone throughout its entire orbit, it's a much more narrow margin that you have to reach. So this is the first circumbinary planet we have found in the habitable zone of uh, both of its stars at the same time. Uh, so, but even though this, this planet is a jupiter size and jupiter mass planet, uh, it's not rocky, so it can't have life. But if it has any moons, then those moons would be in the habitable zone as well. So this is sort of a, a really exciting system to get to observe. Okay, so if you were standing on the surface of a moon orbiting this giant planet, perhaps checking on the water condensers or something, you okay. would see these two stars rising in your in your daytime sky as well you as this. You see that, and you would also see the glow from the planet rising as well. Right, right. A very interesting star planet rise. I don't know what you would call it. What are the like long-term stability implications for these Tatooine worlds? Uh, I, you know, I, will they survive for a long, long time orbiting two stars? Well, this system itself is over, I think it's 
four or five billion years. These stars are the age of the sun. And so this planet, considering it had to form so early on, it's been in a stable orbit for billions of years already. So with, uh, as we've seen with other circumbinary systems, the orbits are more complicated to get right. But if you get it right, you can, you can keep that orbit for billions of years. So this planet will be stable. It has been stable and it will continue to be stable for billions of years to come. Fantastic. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to keep the party rolling pretty quickly here. So, Morgan, let's talk about how the fact that nobody can see the Milky Way anymore. Oh, what a terrible uh, story to have to read this week. But a new study came out showed that one third of all people living on Earth uh, can't see the Milky Way. And if you go to a developed country like the United States, which they studied as a test case, 80% uh, of people live in areas in which you can't uh, regularly see the Milky Way. And that means that there are, in developed uh, countries, whole generations of people who are growing up having never really seen uh, the night sky outside of maybe like a planetarium. And, you know, this is sad for humankind, and it's not great if you're looking to build excitement about astronomy, but it also signals a much sort of larger and deeper problem that we're just starting to come to terms with. And that's the problem of light at night. Uh, and scientific studies uh, led by organizations like the National Institutes for Health and the Centers for Disease Control are starting to show that major chronic illnesses like some forms of cancer are directly related to how much light we're being exposed to at night. And so as astronomers have worked to understand where we can and can't uh, see the night sky, we've also begun to sort of map out places where we um, are facing potential problems going forward in the future with people being exposed to uh, the brightness of modern lighting 24 hours a day. Yeah. Uh, can you see the Milky Way from your backyard? Uh, not from my backyard, although Boulder has a nice uh, sky considering the size of the city. But if I were to drive a few um, kilometers out of town, I would be able to see it pretty easily. Yeah. I can see it from my backyard on a on a like a moonless night, but I can't see it uh, most nights. Also, there's always clouds, so I can't always. But uh, but it's surprising. Like there's a great website called the Dark Sky Finder, and you can punch that in, and then it'll overlay dark sky or or light pollution maps with your. Um, uh, with your location on Google Maps, and it's quite this, this really amazing map. Oh, we're gonna Chad's gonna bring it up here. For the poor folks on the East Coast, they can't go anywhere. Like no matter where they try to go, there is no dark sky for them to go unless they really go way out of town. And for a lot of people in the mega city, you know, that is the East Coast of the United States, they're no matter where they go, there's nothing to see. And the first time that you do see a truly dark night sky is uh, an arresting experience. Uh, it's bewildering to look up and realize that you can't find any of the constellations that you're used to seeing because there are thousands upon thousands of stars uh, filling up the gaps between them. And it makes it even more remarkable to think that people were able to come up with those constellations in the first place uh, with so many thousands of stars visible. Yeah, yeah. And I think, Paul, you're somewhere in the middle area, right? Uh, yeah, so I have a deep view out of my backyard. Uh, I can sometimes see the Milky Way when my neighbor doesn't have his back porch light on. Uh, but uh, I can drive about 10, 15 minutes into some cornfields and get some nice views. Also, there's uh, an hour south of here, there's a nice dark sky preserve yeah. area. And Kimberly, how, how, is, how, how are you doing? Uh, I'm a little bit closer to dark skies than Paul. I think I have about a five, 10 minute drive in any direction because Penn State is smack dab in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. Uh, in town, we can't really see it because they keep the football lights on a lot. But <laughs> That's a thing uh, there. Yeah, but if you actually go north about an hour, there's Cherry Springs State Park, which is one of the first dark sky parks in the country. So I got a chance to go up there a few months ago and it was fantastic. Yeah. But I know I'm sure for a lot of people that are that are watching right now, some of them have just never seen the the Milky Way, and to not have seen it is is crazy. I mean, t if you're one of the people watching and you've never seen the dark, been in truly dark skies and seen the Milky Way, just make a night out of it. Like 
drive a couple of hours to some place, show up at like two in the morning, and it'll it'll blow your mind. It'll be the, one of the most stunning things you've ever seen. And it's you know it's you just got to be a little bit coordinated. Um, maybe time it with a meteor shower. So what can we do, Morgan? Well, things that we can do include using less light uh, outdoors. There are a lot of studies that show that actually increasing the level of lighting in our cities and towns don't necessarily make them safer. And so we uh, spend billions of dollars here in the United States every year on light that actually is projected straight upwards out of light bulbs that aren't properly uh, shielded and directed towards the areas they're intended to light. And so we would save ourselves a ton of money uh, just by properly locating and directing those lights. Uh, and we would preserve our night sky as well. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, let's move on to Earth's new moon. Semi-moon, sort of moon. Quasi-moon. Quasi-moon. Yeah, this is an interesting class of objects. I think we're used to thinking of things in the solar system as uh, definitely orbiting either the sun or one of the planets or just minding their own business, buzzing through, doing their own thing. But there are these kind of special cases where, uh, in this case, uh, a rock, an asteroid, came near enough to the Earth to be uh, influenced by the gravity of the Earth, but not enough to be truly captured by it and become a permanent long-term satellite of the Earth. So that's what we have. We have this, oh, that's what we call the quasi-moon, uh, came under influence about 100 years ago, we think, and it will be uh, in our quasi-orbit for another few hundred years before it eventually moves on. What's happening here is the moon is, or this little object is moving, is orbiting around the sun uh, in a very similar orbit as the earth is. Sometimes it's a little bit ahead of the earth. Sometimes it's a little bit behind the earth. So the earth is like, uh, the researcher said that it's doing a little dance with this object, a very complicated orbit. Um, and uh, it's really small. It's like just a few hundred feet across, and it's really dark. <laughs> um, As most things in space are. Is that really a moon? It's a quasi-moon. Yeah. It's I'm... kind of orbiting the Earth for a little while. Yeah, it's hanging out with us for a bit. It's just, you know, it's just stopping by for a visit, a little chat, and then it's going to go on its way. Well, because there was this big uh, controversy about, uh, there was an episode of, what's that show, QI? In the states and the, sorry, in in the UK, and they and they asked the question, how many moons does the Earth have? And everyone got it wrong because they thought that the the Earth had a second moon. Um, I forget its name, but it's not. And so quasi is the exact right. You know, if you call a thing that sort of thanks to gravitational interaction, sort of hangs out every now and then for a few thousand years and then skips off into space. That does not cut it for, for yeah. moon. Yeah, I mean, the moon moon, the capital M moon, has been here for a while, and it's not going anywhere for a while, so yeah. it gets called just a normal moon. Yeah. This uh, quasi-moon, temporarily influenced by the Earth's gravity, but not forever. Yeah. I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm, you know what, I, I just don't think, it's cool, it's an asteroid. It's an, a, but it's a, Oh, but some are Phobos and Deimos. Yeah. But they get to be called moon moons. But they go around the... Yeah, and right? this object is going around the Earth for mm. a few hundred years. Okay, all right. All right, I'm not buying it, but... All right. I, you, know, we'll, you, know, we'll you, know why, you know why I'm not buying it? You want to know why I'm not buying it? Because I have been burned too many times in the past reporting, enthusiastically reporting that earth has a second moon and then it turns out to be some spent apollo you know rocket stage well it's not my fault if you're a bad reporter i know that's i should have i should have dug deeper into my sources and really double checked so but thank you for really clarifying it all right let's move on to the next story we're going to come back around the horn and talk to kimberly again and this time we're going to talk about doing the 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 worst possible thing you can do in space light a fire well, in this case, the lighting of the fires in space is actually a good thing. I don't need to trust me on that one, but it's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> this experiment is called the Space Fire Experiment, and it's a collaboration between NASA Glenn, which is in Cleveland, and uh, Orbital ATK Cygnus. And it's designed in a very controlled way 
to test how fires spread in space. And it's designed so that later on, when we want to do long-term spaceflight missions, perhaps to Mars, if, heaven forbid, something goes wrong, we will know how to deal with it. So these are the first, uh, this is, the, I think, the largest controlled fire experiment in space. Uh, it took place in about a 45 cubic foot space module that was attached to the Cygnus unit that went up to resupply the space station uh, back in March. And they did a very controlled burn of a cotton fiber, what was it, cotton fiberglass blend of material. And they did a very controlled burn of it because they wanted to see how the fire would react to the, in the microgravity environment of space. Um, this is, it, the experiment went very, very well. It happened, they're getting the, the data and the images as we speak, and they'll analyze them so that they can plan for the next two SAFIRE experiments, uh, one which will uh, understand how the different oxygenated environment works and what are the oxygen burning limits of space. And the third SAFIRE uh, will also be a microgravity experiment. But we need to do these tests so that later on, if something goes wrong in a long-term space flight and there's fires in space, which are really bad, but if we know how those fires will behave and how those fires behave differently from when they're on Earth, we will be able to make safer environments for our future astronauts. It's, uh, I guess it's, it's better to to light the fire now in a very safe and controlled place yeah. to see how it behaves before. I mean, we all watched Gravity, right? It it was a bad scene. I haven't. I still haven't seen Gravity yet. It is shameful. Fire. But okay, let me. Fire bad. Fire is, bad. Yeah. Gotcha. Let me just. Let me just. Well, really we've been very fortunate up to this point that we haven't had to deal with a large scale fire in space. We've been very fortunate. Uh, but if we want to do long-term space flight missions, we need to understand that because that is a real risk. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the, the closest... Well, there was no no accidents or anything like that. They got the data they need, and they're just uh, taking time to, to analyze it right now. Yeah, I mean, I guess the really fascinating thing is what it does in the zero-G gravity mm -hmm. because here on Earth, right, the, you have the fire, and it's all completely controlled by gravity, and the, the hot gases float upward, and they pool at the ceiling and then they all ignite and and you know the whole house burns down but yeah. but there they you're not going to get yeah they Don't. actually have some really cool videos uh posted on the nasa website for those that are interested in watching uh they have some of the first ignition images from the uh sapphire module so uh, i'm sure it's pretty cool to watch chad is looking for them right now uh but why don't we move on to the uh to the next story uh, we're going to go next to Morgan, and we're going to talk about uh, eight space telescopes renewed by NASA. Yeah, we've talked in the past about NASA's senior review process, uh, which is the process by which every uh, active mission that has reached the end of its primary mission or the end of one of its extended missions has to basically go before the principal and justify their continued existence. And last year, this happened for many of uh, NASA's interplanetary missions like Mars Curiosity and Cassini. Uh, and this year, it was the turn for NASA's eight orbiting space telescopes. Uh, and I'm happy to uh, report that all eight uh, have been renewed for a further uh, period of study, although not every one will receive the full amount of funding uh, that they desired. So the telescopes they were looking at uh, were the gamma ray telescopes Fermi and Swift, uh, the X-ray telescopes Chandra and New Star, uh, the participation in the ESA mission XMM Newton, also an X-ray uh, telescope, as well as Spitzer, Hubble, and Kepler. And there was never any question that Hubble and the Chandra X-ray Observatory were going to be renewed. But the other six have all actually been operating now for quite some time, and there was question about whether they would be able to justify enough new science for investing additional funds in. And obviously the answer was yes, and perhaps most surprisingly, the mission of those six that was rated most highly uh, was the Kepler K2 mission. Uh, despite the fact that the spacecraft itself is quite hobbled and in fact just recently recovered from yet another uh, orbital emergency, the 
observations uh, that they've been able to make with Kepler have remained quite strong and unlike observations that any other telescope can make. And so NASA was quite uh, forceful in its desire to continue funding Kepler uh, for the next couple of years as well. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite? Well, it's hard not to like Kepler because before that we had this sort of piddly picture of what exoplanets looked like uh, out there in the universe. And now we have this picture where every week we can come up and talk about a, a brand new exoplanet. But of those six telescopes, probably the most important right now is Spitzer because Spitzer, the infrared telescope, is going to pave the way for uh, the next big NASA telescope, James Webb, which launches hopefully in 2018. Uh, and in fact, during this senior review, NASA directed Spitzer to make observations, basically that would be in preparation for James Webb to ensure that the smoothest possible transition from this generation of telescope to the next generation of telescope can safely take place. Very cool. Um, I'm, I'm excited. Well, you know, I always offer that the Canadian government will be glad to take over any of the space missions that, that you guys, you know, can't handle anymore. I, I know I speak for the all of Canadians when I say that we'll pitch in our loonies and toonies to help you guys out. So, so it's so once again, uh, you guys figured it out, but we're always ready. Yeah, these smaller missions uh, cost about fifteen million dollars uh, a year to operate. That's, and a, so that's given, about our budget. Yeah, right. Getting given the amount of money it takes to build and launch and one of these guys, it doesn't make sense to let them go uh, as long as you can wring any additional science out of them. Yeah. All right. Well, I think for our last story, we're going to go back to Kimberly and we're going to talk about uh, too many hot Jupiters. There are too many hot Jupiters, man. Uh, a collaboration between uh, European and South American astronomers were looking for exoplanets in Messier 67, which is an open star cluster that's about four or five billion years old. And they were using the radio velocity technique to search for these exoplanets and they found way more than they were expecting to find. In particular, they found about five times as many hot Jupiter exoplanets than they expected to find. Now these hot Jupiters are roughly Jupiter-sized orbit in very, very short orbits close to their stars, making them incredibly hot. And astronomers have known or suspected for a while that hot Jupiters don't actually form in their current positions, but they have to form in the outer parts of their solar systems where there's more favorable conditions for planet formation and somehow make their way all the way inwards to where we see them now. So. In retrospect, it may not be as surprising that hot Jupiters are more common in an, in an environment that has very crazy gravitational interactions, like a star cluster. But we had no idea that such a thing would happen. Uh, where, uh, for stars that aren't in star clusters, we see about 1% of those stars have a hot Jupiter planet. Uh, in Messier 67, uh, there are about 5% of those stars that have hot Jupiters. So that's a really strong piece of evidence to say that we're on the right track in thinking about how, how hot Jupiters get to where they are, that there has to be some sort of gravitational interaction that pushes these planets inward. Uh, that's, unfortunately, it means that in star clusters, the probability of a habitable zone planet or a rocky planet is going to be even lower because when hot Jupiters uh, migrate from, their, from the position they form in to their current stable orbits, they essentially knock out anything that gets in its way. So the probability for habitable planets, not so much in star clusters, but hot Jupiters, uh, there appear to be a lot more than we expected. What, I mean, I guess, what are the, you, you talked a bit about the chances of habitable planets in those. So are the hot Jupiters kind of slowly floating in and wrecking the inner solar systems of these, of these around these stars? Yeah, so in, in planetary systems where you have more than one planet orbiting a star, those planets that do exert gravitational force on each other and very slightly impact the orbit. And so you have to get a stable balance between all of your planets around the same star to have them survive. And when one of those really massive planets decides that it's going to start traveling across hundreds of astronomical units to get to a new orbit, uh, it greatly destabilizes things and will most likely either eject any planets in its way or send them careening inwards towards the star. 
that's not good. Right. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think we've sort of run out of time and we've run out of stories, which is a interesting happenstance. Uh, what were the chances of that? So uh, why don't we give everyone a chance to uh, so we can find out more? Uh, Morgan Renberg, where do people find out more about uh, about what you do? Well, you can follow me on Twitter at Morgan Renberg or visit my website, MorganRenberg.com. Fantastic. Uh, Paul Matt Sutter. Yes. Where people more? can find me at Twitter and Facebook at Paul Matt Sutter, P-A-U-L-M-A-T-T-S-U-T-T-E-R. It's my name right, right there. Wait, okay, there Paul it is. Paul Matt um, Sutter. That's it. And you should absolutely check out his YouTube channel. You absolutely should. Uh, and if you watch the latest episode of Guide to Space, there'll be a handy link there and a familiar face in that episode. Wibble wobble, wibble wobble. Wibble wobble. It's what space does. I can't help it. I, I, I know. You you tore apart everybody's comprehension of what a virtual particle is. It's into all wibbly wobbly. Into a wibble wobble, wobble, yeah. Wobbly. Bloop bloop. Wibble wobble, bloop bloop. You got to watch the video if you don't understand what I'm talking about. Uh, awesome. All right. Uh, Kimberly. People can find out more by following me on Twitter at Astro Kim Cartier or by going to my website, KimberlyCartier.org. Spelled like it is over there. Over there. I pointed at my name. There. 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 Nope. There. <laughs> there. I don't know how it works. It's, it's backwards. It's so it's how it's, it's backwards is how it works. It looks like I, from my point of view, it looks like I'm pointing at my name, but. <laughs> I don't, clearly don't know how this works either. <laughs> um, well, so thanks everybody for joining us this week and a big thanks to the folks from LIGO for bringing the science. Uh, what an amazing guest and what great timing. So that's really wonderful. Another big shout out to the folks at the WSH crew. This is of course the community of people who really gather together, organize and produce this show. We are merely their puppets. They help us find all of the special guests. They help coordinate a lot of the live events that we're doing. Uh, we really couldn't uh, do anything with uh, without them. Paul, you're telling us something? About uh, yeah, Kai Stotts. Uh, he is also, a besides an amazing documentary filmmaker, he is also the film producer for Song of the Stars. Wonderful. I can see. And, of course, Song of the Stars is the Kickstarter that we all helped you push across the line. Yeah, so you helped pay me so I could pay Kai to do something good. Fantastic. Uh, we, then we're, you're welcome? Yes. We're all welcome. <laughs> we're, all, we're all welcome. Okay, great. And if you haven't already, uh, if you like this kind of space thing, uh, make sure you subscribe to this channel. Another reminder, we're going to be doing Astronomy Cast in about 20 minutes, but you're going to need to go over to the Astronomy Cast uh, YouTube channel to, to pick up the conversation over there. So definitely join us over there as we start up in about 20 minutes. In fact, I have to invite Pamela in like five minutes. So anyway, thanks everyone for watching. We'll see you all next week for the see last ya. episode. Bye. End the broadcast? Sure, end the broadcast. Okay. Oh, oh, complete the event. Complete the event. <laughs>